Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Paul. Uh, I'm a technical architect uh, to the Government Digital Service. In case you're wondering what a technical architect is, like I was when I took the job, turns out to be a developer who goes to lots of meetings. Um, I'm actually, um, the, 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 the Government Digital Service are part of the Cabinet Office, which means I'm a civil servant. Uh, so I just ask you to be a bit gentle with me. And also you might question how you come to a conference where the keynote's being given by a civil servant. That's your problem. Um, so the talk is, is entitled Make Things Open, Make Them Better. It's one of our design principles, uh, one of the things that we follow quite, um, we kind of really strongly believe in. It's quite tricky, uh, but it's sort of also a little bit of a boring title because really the new normalcy in, in sort of where we work is everybody just uses open source. It's like, well, why are you talking about open source? It's just a thing we do. And um, I think it's good to sort of talk about sort of not just open source, but like open cultures and how that's a challenge for like organisations like government departments who might not necessarily be as open as they might be because whenever they open their mouths or say the wrong thing, they get caned. And so I'll try and sort of um, explain what we're doing without sort of saying the wrong thing and, and opening my mouth too much and getting caned. Um, there's, you might want to know how we came about. There's, um, there was this letter which um, uh, Martha Lane Fox, who was then the digital champion for government, uh, you know, former founder of Last FM, so she's from the web, um, wrote to uh, Francis Maud, who's, I, till I met him, didn't think was from the web either. But um, she basically sort of, with some help from friends from my society and the people working in open organisations and within government departments who understood about digital and about the web and, and open source, um, set out basically our roadmap. She said, you can have a revolution, not an evolution with government services. Government IT is horribly broken. The web's broken as far as you know, government's concerned. Fix it by starting again. And she set out this roadmap, which is basically um, to create our organisation, the Government Digital Service, put them in charge. They're in charge of digital. And uh, when we started out, I don't think that scared anybody because we thought digital is this little bit of tinsel at the top. And uh, as we've gone on, I think we start to realise the power of that. Um, any sort of spend that's over a million pounds on anything to do with IT or digital comes through us. Um, that doesn't mean anything that's spent more than a million quid is our fault. It just means it either predates us or it's kind of like the right best thing to do at the time. Um, we also sort of basically, um, uh, we kind of lead the charge in the way that the people sort of build and expose things onto the web and not just the web actually in terms of the web is, you know, my passion but lots of ways that we can interact with people, which isn't the web, for people who aren't on the web. I'll come to that in a bit. Um, so the second thing was to fix publishing. Um, government had hundreds of websites, and the only thing they had in common was they're all different, and they all came from different suppliers and different amounts of money. And, um, you know, you've seen the XKCD cartoon, which is, you know, the Venn diagram of what you want from a university site and what the university site offers, and there's very little overlap. It's quite true, I think, of a lot of, you know, departments. You have to understand the structure of government to know how to interact with it. And so by bringing together everything onto one platform, gov.uk, um, you, know, you don't need to understand that. If you want to do all these different things you might want to do with government, you just go to one place. Third thing is quite tricky. Uh, government in the UK is federated. Um, services you deal with are dealt with by local councils or by a department or by an agency or by a training fund or, you know, they're all over the place. And um, so we're going out and helping those people um, do a better job of, of answering your needs as a, as, a, as a user, as a citizen. Well, a subject, actually, not a citizen. Um, and then the final thing is, actually, um, other people can do things better than government. That's a surprise, maybe. But um, it's to actually enable other people to do things in a better way. And that doesn't mean introducing intermediaries because the forms filling for a new passport is so horrendous. It's kind of letting people glue things together and, and add value. Um, so when we first started, you know, when in fact Martha Lane wrote, a, wrote a, um, her report, she cited Direct Gov and she talked about Direct Gov a lot. It was it was a citizen-facing website. It was thirty million pounds a year. Basically, it was a bunch of pages which got loaded up to Akamai every night, and um, it was kind of all right. But you know, I, I kind of didn't use it much, I don't know anybody else here used it much. Uh, there's another site which I never used because I couldn't, and neither could the people who built it, because uh, I asked them to show me how it works, they couldn't. Um, it's Business Link, which is where all the business information was on there. There was a massive rabbit warren of information, 
Google can work out. If you Google things, you never found it. You never hit business link link. Um, so what happened was we got a small team together. I think there was probably about a dozen people. Um, it's kind of how we work now. It's sort of set the model for how we work across all of government. Very small team, started small. Uh, the team isn't just developers. Um, it contained uh, content editors because writing things in English for people who are English or not English who are trying to get a visa to come to England is sort of seems like good sense uh, rather than legalese or civil servant ease. Um, designers, uh, user researchers, you know, um, a whole raft of skills come together of which a core component is people can make things and get them in, get them in front of users to experiment with and learn from that. So they built this alpha. Um, it was kind of all right. It had some issues. One of them was accessibility, which um, is definitely something we care about a lot. But for a prototype to actually say this is what the vision could be for single domain, it was good enough to get approval to actually create us and to then move on to a beta. The beta uh, is basically something that's more real. You can do real day stuff with it. But the old site was still there during that time. And then on October the 17th um, last year, we, we, um, we kind of uh, bait and switched the whole nation and just, just redirected direct gov to gov UK and we didn't appear in the Daily Mail as a result, which amazes me now. But um, you know, we got on with it. And the site continues to improve, even though we've launched. This is a big change for a lot of government systems, which treat buying a website like buying a bridge or a tank or a boat that actually, when it's, there's a pro, you know, the word program always scares the bejesus out of me because uh, it kind of means that there's going to be, you know, it's like concentrating on pregnancy and not remembering you're going to have a child. And so when the website came along, we were, it's a live thing and it continues to change. And this is vaguely what it looks like now. It may have changed today. Um, for example, no, we, we changed the logo. The top of there is Gil Sands. We changed that to transport, the font. That would be a big thing before. That would involve all sorts of, you know, brand people and letters around. It was like one eye of CSS. We changed the, the brand identity for the government website. And nobody noticed. So this is kind of the big, big difference. You know, rather than actually sort of this, you know, big design up front, you know, procurement, tendering, you know, two years later, here's the thing you asked for. I, I didn't really want that. Don't have to do that to actually start really small build up, make it, make it more real. You're all looking at me blankly because that's the obvious way to do it. But actually, you know. <laughs> so after sort of building the beta, we kind of learned quite a lot. And one of the things we learned um, in kind of the agile tradition is we sort of did a retrospective. And we thought about how do we work and what do we hold dear? And we wrote them down. And so I'm going to sort of introduce these throughout the talk. But these are design principles. I kind of think it's one of the best things we've done because even if we disappear tomorrow, some massive re government reorganisation, this is something I'll, I'll use elsewhere. And that's kind of one of the values we know about open source is when you move gigs, you can carry on working on the thing you've been working on. And it's brilliant. So the first um, principle is start with the needs. And, those are, and this is actually this is a mind-blowing thing to say to a government department who talk about themselves being businesses. Like HMR, so HMRC talks about or talked about itself as being a business and that you were customers. Blue neck, I'm not a customer of HMRC, I'm paying tax, right? You're providing a service to me. Um, so the needs that, 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 you know, institutions, you know, you have to, there are some things you have to do, they're kind of grudge transactions, you have to pay your fines, you have to sort of pay your parking tax, you know, your car tax. Um, but we should do it in such a way that it's not an encumbrance that, you know, doesn't make you swear too much or burst into tears. Um, to give you a good example sort of, of something that didn't really answer the user need, which is uh, bank holidays. So it would take you a small amount of time to work out when the next bank holiday was, and you're not partially sighted, or, uh, or treat your know, English as a second language, or maybe a few people in this room is, but you're probably in a conference. You can hear, if you can understand what I'm saying, you're doing pretty well. Uh, not all our u readers um, of the site are actually in that position. So what we do is, um, we kind of open up rather than dumb down. You know, we try and make things easy. And so the big user need is when is the next bank holiday? And we put that right up front and centre. And you can sort of see as a hint of an API there, you can download the, uh, the clock changes and ICS. So it's just sort of making this sound accessible to you know, all people, including machines. 
And similarly, you know, oh, that was, that was when do the clocks change? Sorry, I've got them wrong around. And, you know, when do the clocks change? And these are bank holidays. Um, we also have um, internationalization. So there's, you know, information from the Foreign Office. You might think it's a UK government site. Turns out to have a wide readership, not just among citizens who are traveling, but also from people who are coming to the country or who are interested in what UK is doing. Um, there are a number of sort of uh, services on here, and I would just say at the moment, GovUK um, as a domain at the moment is in a position, because we haven't got to transactions fully yet, where you kind of have this portal experience where it says start now. But the best we can do is to sort of tell you what you have to do before you go there and how long it's going to take and sort of do some advice. Um, so you can apply for a passport, you can apply for a passport for your horse, you can. Um, uh, there's, there's quite a few sort of, this, it's a funny thing to say that uh, this is a kind of, um, there's quite a few lump in the throat moments when you work on this kind of content, but looking at analytics, this page is quite, you know, emotive, and yet, you know, we'll probably all be in cer that circumstance one day when we're saying, oh, what do I have to do, somebody, somebody I love's died. Last thing you want is, you know, direct gov kind of content where it's just like, oh, I've got to now work a maze of twisty pastures to get to this thing. It's like, very clear thing, get a medical certificate, register the death, range of funeral, boom, I can do that. So I think I've got a mental model. It's not one that sort of GDS sort of is codified, but it's one I'm, I'm using, finding useful, which is basically we've got three buckets of things, which is there's content, which is baked for everybody on GovUK. We all understand that, a web page. Then there's kind of um, stuff which is just between you and government, a bit like the Amazon checkout. You know, it's like, you know, you've got, you've, bought your books on the website, which is public, but then you've kind of gone to sort of pay for it, and you appreciate that that's like, you know, just between me and you and them, and I'm not going to be able to Google my previous orders. Uh, but then there's stuff in the middle, and the stuff in the middle is a bit sort of wishy-washy, but it's kind of calculators and, um, and searches and things, which do involve some kind of, you know, um, it's like more like being fried up to you to order ba rather than being baked for everybody. And... I think at the moment we're kind of doing a good job on content and we're addressing because we're getting onto the transaction services and the tools in the middle, we're hoping that will come out in the mix. But the tools for me are really interesting because that's where data resides. So I want to get hold of flood alerts or hold of um, um, statistics, but in their raw form, I want the data raw rather than cooked. You know, tools are where it'll come. And I think on the, that's something I'm pushing personally quite strongly. Uh, one of our big sort of mantras is do less. So I kind of want to best examples I've got of this is, this is your direct gov, uh, government advice for holding a greener barbecue. And the government advice is to pull on the pullover. Uh, we don't do that anymore. So we kind of, we kind of didn't, we didn't move that page over to GovUK, we kind of, but we, you know, leave it on the National Archives. If you want to have a laugh about it later. Um, <laughs> the result of that is actually GovUK has actually radically less content, fewer pages than the sites we switched off. But it turns out we're actually, uh, our uh, analytics show us that more people uh, are visiting the site and our user research shows that more people's needs have been answered by the site. I think that's quite a good goal. And it's sort of an agile, sort of open source-y thing because they're open source, you kind of solve one problem that you've got and then if it's a generic problem, great. Um, but actually by doing less, you can go faster, which is sort of, you know, people find in counterintuitive, but you know you have to read the mythical man month to understand that. I mean, one example of that is, um, is when I arrived at GDS, I wrote a rather excited blog post about coming to work with this amazing team, and I confidently predicted that the icons on the website would appear on tea towels and in gift shops on, you know, tea mats and things. And um, a few weeks later, they, they removed from the site because nobody was using them and nobody understood what they were there for and they were just not needed. Um, one thing we did add was um, the typography. So I mentioned the, 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 the font changing. Uh, we use Transport, which is um, a really good British font. It was tested by driving at 70 miles an hour in the rain, and it's pretty good for a website. Well, well um, a yes. <laughs> the next stage from standing desks. Um, so, <coughs> uh, and kind of, I mentioned this before about XKCD cartoon and uh, the, the websites, but we have a principle which is. Basically, um, booking a prison visit should be not much different to booking a driving test. And so we've got all these federated stuff. We've got to try and make them feel a bit like they've got a cohesive hull. And so I mentioned this before about the, um, the kind of all these websites all over the place. 
This is a, something that so the, this data for the cost of those websites is open. And one of our one of the lads um, in our uh, he was 17 when he wrote this uh, wrote a play your cards right game where it sort of threw up a website and said, well, how much do you think this is higher or lower cost than the one that went before it? Some of the costs in there were shocking. I think it was shocking to the people who were running websites and paying a million and a half pounds for a WordPress install. Um, the other thing to say is um, the information architecture of UK is, is actually more powerful than people realise, I think. And so there was no, uh, before Gov UK, there was no government, single government policy for Falkland Islands, and there were like 14 for Afghanistan, and they all had different sort of goals and objectives, and who knows, probably they, they were in conflict. Um, so we don't have that. We have one page, which has got a reason you know, to be there. And uh, instead of having you know, separate pages for all the offices, they all collaborate on that one page. And it doesn't take much to realise how information architecture can really sort of help you know, government sort of put out a cohesive message. We're kind of driven by um, users, uh, which is, again, is I mean, I've done a bunch of open source, and the kind of driving force for open source is solving my problem, and I'm a developer. Uh, but it's only when you kind of watch somebody who's uh, trying to fill in a form uh, for care seekers allowance, who's, you know, if, you, if you've got somebody who's uh, disabled and you look after them for more than 35 hours a week, you get paid a pittance, uh, but you have to fill in a 300-page form to do that. And when we took, did conduct user tra testing with those people, they would be faced with questions which would make them burst into tears. And we videoed that. We showed it in front of ministers and people in charge of policy. And the result was the questionnaire went out to 80 questions. Uh, but we can improve. we just got to keep doing this user testing, make people realise how difficult these websites are to use. And so, uh, you know, an ultimate uh, case of this, if anybody who works in an advertising agency is kind of finds this a bit of a freak out, but actually the best way to answer a lot of people's user needs is for them not to visit the site at all. So, if, you know, if they want to know when the next bank holidays are, I mean, I'm not saying everybody should use Google, but, you know, there are other places to find that information. <coughs> if we can s disseminate that through APIs. As this radical humming back um, led us to be to win Design of the Year uh, last year ahead of the Heatherwick Cauldron and the Shard, which amazed all of us, including the Daily Mail, who just didn't get it at all. You know, boring.com wins the Design Award. So I, I don't think I'm going to sort of um, basically uh, show this video to you. Um, it's kind of a bit scary, uh, but when they launched DirectGov, they had a problem. They had a, you know, how do we tell people to go to this website? And so they did the usual thing of sort of running an advert with loads of B-lips uh, celebrities, many, few of whom you'll probably recognise or remember their names. But at the time, you know, it was probably quite a costly exercise, and it ran all the time, and there were posters everywhere, and I don't suppose anybody remembers this advert. It would be amazing if anybody does. But um, I might switch it off before we get to... I was going to say it's probably too late. I'll yeah, I'll, I'll save you. There's a Christopher Biggins dressed as a baby farting, which is more than you want to see this time in the morning. So the way, you know, I mentioned before, the kind of way we launched was basically you just redirect to the nation and kind of nobody noticed or really cared. Um, and that's, to do that was quite an exercise. We had to sort of like, we had to, we had to um, map uh, about um, 40,000 pages. And as we move on, moving the departments over and the agencies, we're up to about two and a half, about a quarter of a million mappings from old, old links to new links as we move them on to GovUK. Launching was a real sort of uh, scary moment for me personally. I was kind of doing the Akamai pushes and the, um, and the, and the DNS changes, you know, for the, nas the nation's website. And then when they all woke up in the morning, it just worked. And that was a massive relief. And, you know, uh, cake was, was eaten and beer was drunk. It sort of still amazes me that we, you know, everything we use, the whole website is based on open source software. And it's still, you know, somebody who grew up with James Bond uh, just amazed me that we've got a Russian web server on the British government website. <laughs> um, so no, we don't just use it, you know, sort of uh, qualitative research. We also use quantitative research. And that kind of applies to a lot of things, including like how we build our infrastructure. Um, you know, back in the day, you know, it was an option I did at, at college was operations research because buying kit and caboodle was so expensive that you had to do lots of science before you even contemplated buying a disc, you know. And kind of in this day and age, we haven't got time for all that. 
And it's actually easy because what you do is you just measure everything and then when you're running out of stuff, you buy more stuff or you kind of rethink about moving stuff around and you can be reactive. And kind of data really helps you just, just you know, be able to just change and evolve your architecture. Uh, and also kind of, you can also learn lots of things. I mean, um, having a government website is great. You have so many people using it. Uh, we have um, about one and a half million users, you know, unique visitors a day. Um, and, you know, there's lots you can learn from those. So, for example, there's a big question about how many people actually receive JavaScript, for example. And um, it, it turns out to be quite a significant number for us because like 1% of one and a half million people is still a lot of people. So um, that is, so if you actually go to our blog, this, that, 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 that's a, there's a blog post behind that. In fact, everything I'm saying here is, is in the open and Googleable and findable or whatever. I keep using Google, but you know, there's other search engines are available. <laughs> and you know, this data sort of, all our, all our developers have access to analytics, which I find both amazing and troubling as somebody who cares about privacy. Uh, but the, the power of, the, of, the, of that is, is quite enormous. So, for example, here's a chart of usage of, of browsers, and you can see that what people prefer to use when they go home is not IE6. And so these tell really powerful stories, and so they actually change the way that we deal with people in departments to sort of go from, why don't we just give everybody, um, you know, a, a, a the latest bulletproof sort of secured down sort of, you know, laptop that's, that's insanely difficult to use to actually, well, let's, let's try and find tools and techniques which, which work for them. Again, I was kind of troubled by the, the mantra to build uh, digital services, not websites, but that's because the digital service, I think as you're starting to see, is more than just the web. It's kind of basically it's a smooshing together of developers and operational people and thinking about users and putting users in charge. But when it comes to architecture, um, it's really powerful. In fact, you know, this, arch this is actually, uh, there's a video online um, which you can probably find if you look for something like making government so there's better video, I don't know. And um, this guy here put together an architecture which is basically GovUK at the top, lots of these little apps and services, and then at the bottom, hosted infrastructure and lots of services like identity and payments and things which are shared. And it's kind of a bit freaky for people who've kind of grown up with um, architecture. It's kind of useful for me to be a technical architect because um, I kind of, you know, I can speak authoritatively about architecture to people. Uh, but actually, I don't really care about architecture. Most of the time, they come armed with a diagram or a set of diagrams, things like uh, final state or um, transition. It'd be this stack of diagrams that are kind of like a, a, a thing. And I kind of look at them and squint at them. I kind of sc scribbled this just a minute ago. Um, so it's probably going to get me fired, but um, it's kind of just there's loads of sort of just wacky things on there, and people just shove stuff on there, and that comes that mindset. I've got to buy it all now. So oh, comes we might need a data warehouse. I better shove it on the diagram. Better put it in the tender, otherwise it won't ever happen. Because it's quite hard to change things as you go along in your world. And the other thing is, once they've justified something and they've put a lot of work into into something, like they've they've managed to get you know a honking great sort of um, I won't mention the vendor name, but a big database, you know. Um, they kind of, or a CRM, once they manage to go through the effort and pain of getting that thing, you've got to reuse it. And, you know, it's not always desirable. You know, th this is Mike Bracken, who kind of runs our, our show, and um, he's in charge of GDS. And, you know, he says no more big IT. And I don't think that's, that's not about necessarily the size of the companies providing IT. It's about the sort of way that we, um, you know, we, we should move away from procuring IT to commissioning it, to so starting small and building up. And there's a role for everybody involved in that, but we just got to do things more sanely. So the kind of good, the architecture for GovUK is kind of the architecture any of us would build for a website. We use layering, we use caching, you know, we use up, you know, varnish, nginx, a bit of Postgres here, a bit of MySQL there, just whatever sort of works for us. Um, and I got into trouble this week for sharing this this diagram, but it sort of says a lot that when I put it on the web, that they reckon, even though they hadn't seen that drawing before. They knew it was their architecture because of the the users were involved and some of the problems it was trying to solve. But you know, this is kind of the if you don't need a honking great database, which is a source of truth, you can sort of employ sort of kind of um, patterns, architectural patterns we see from the web. You know, things like Bitcoin and Git, where you kind of you've got sort of information that's distributed and you work out 
the problem you're trying to solve. Are you trying to do some deal with confidentiality? Are you trying to deal with integrity of the data? Are you trying to make it more available? And those things don't have like one off-the-shelf solution of loads of, uh, you know, package jockeyed sort of uh, vendor software. Um, one of the things you do need to sort of to, to, to do that is, you know, open source will get you, you know, a long way, but actually if you want to swap things around, you do need standards. And if you want to have reach to people like the calendar thing, you need standards. And there's a thing called the Open Standards Board, which um, I represent GT GDS on, but it's people from outside of government, um, from the Open Data Institute and uh, academia and NHS. And we're trying to sort of devise standards and sort of say, well, the, t the two statements we've made so far are kind of laughable, but um, we said, if you're going to do character encoding, you maybe should use UTF-8. Turns out that's massive, right? <coughs> and so if you're writing a contract and you sort of talk about, oh, you can put it in ASCII, no, you can't, you've got to do it in UTF-8. So another one we said was, if you're going to sort of create a, a persistent resolvable identifier, use a URL, you know, duh. But again, that sort of, that, that actually did disenfranchise a lot of big contracts and that has a massive effect. And so just doing these small things can really you know, change the way government sort of works. Um, you've seen this again, you know, we kind of work in this kind of refinement way, step by refinement. I think it's like a maturity model for what we do. Um, in fact, it's a maturity model which you might find useful, which is always start with solving one problem. Solve it for yourself, solve it for a project, and it's really small in scope. And then if it turns out more than one of you are solving that same problem or have that same issue, or at least some common bit, you can do the open source thing of having like a core which you both agree upon uh, and then have some extensions where the bits where you don't agree. And so you build a product. And then if a lot of you have that, that kind of find that product useful, maybe you host it somewhere and it becomes a platform. So instead of just sharing deployments, you share you know, service. And in, in GovUK, we've kind of followed that and we've now got a... Um, We've got two platforms. One of them is for um, holding performance data, which is something everybody has and nobody wants to, to do. And the other one is, um, is identity. So we're building a, a federated sign-in for government services, where, um, and again, it's been driven by user research. It's sort of, I think it's going to work. I hope it's going to work. Uh, but it's a radically new thing, where when you go to you know, uh, renew your passport, you're faced with um, the option of, of verifying identification using a, um, the post office, Verizon, Experian, bunch of other uh, services which will come along. You can choose who you want to go to verify your trust. And then when you actually log in, the provider doesn't know which service you're using and the service doesn't know which provider you used. So it's kind of, it's really built around the whole, um, um, you know, um, uh, privacy issues, which the no to ID brigade, you know, kind of really push on us. And there are some identity principles. It's worth researching that if you're interested in it. The other thing that's sort of really useful, um, but actually very hard, is, is trying to convince people that when you're iterating, that everything you're doing is of value. I mean, I kind of wince when departments say, we don't understand technology, so we're bringing in you know, some supplier to um, check that the code quality of the supplier that we've engaged is good enough. I say, well, hang on. So You've got, to, you've got to accept that there's lots of technical debt in any, in any good project. In fact, we absolutely in actively encourage, we, we really encourage people to make things badly, as long as they make them quickly and they learn from them. And the things that are useless, you throw away. <laughs> things that are really good, then you refine. The idea that every sort of, every sort of uh, bit of stuff you do is a block on a Gantt chart, a brick in a wall that you're building, is not what we're doing. So we really sort of, you know, this is again where open source really helps because you can nick stuff. You know, you can just nick ideas and just try them out. And if they're good, they stick. And if they're rubbish, you throw them away. Um, so I mentioned accessibility. That's a probably talk in itself, but it's massively important. You know, we have to make our services available to everybody. And that sort of, um, that is highly depends upon the service. So the demographic for, pe for farmers filling in their, their, their cap subsidy is radically different to the care seekers allowance or, um, or people visiting a prison. And so we do lots of um, research. We have lots of tactics and uh, ways of uh, dealing with um, channel shifts so people who can use the service but maybe just think the phone's easier to um, assisted digital where, it's where people um, are kind of just never will be able to get online for whatever reason. Um, 
that's a whole massive topic it's own right but again there's stuff on our blog and on our website about that um, the one thing we do know is we don't know how many services there are that this number changes I think it's about 720 now and they're spread across all these departments and just keeping track of that is really hard um, so um, the other thing to say is a massive long tail uh, of services um, I think it says on this one burials at sea 10 burials at sea every year and there's like one head of burning burning certificate every year um, we're not going to put a lot of effort into digitizing those you might be pleased to hear but it turns out the ones at the top I mean uh, my experience in industry um, is operating at a scale way above anything in government right I mean you know kind of I keep getting asked for references for things which are like have 90,000 users and make applica one application a year. You know, can you show me somebody else who's doing this in the industry? Well, um, you might find it hard because it's not actually that big a problem and you know, I can't find a use case that matches that. But it turns out the kind of the expectation is that it will work and that you won't, uh, we won't make a mistake and that's kind of and if we do make a mistake, you know, we appear in the papers. So that kind of mentality is really hard for people in charge of services. That's why they do this big thinking up front and analysis paralysis. Um, so the, it's probably, uh, it's a tricky thing, but it's really, we can gamify this a little bit. We can sort of sh start showing them data to each other. And so there is a, a glorified spreadsheet called the Transactions Explorer, which shows you the cost per transaction. Um, one of the transactions I was working on, uh, the cost per transaction we worked out, you could actually take somebody uh, to the Ritz and Rolls Royce, fill in their form and take them back in and still be in, in profit. Uh, but um, that's a bit unfair on them because, you know, um, that's the circumstances they're under because they're so scared of making mistakes. They've just, you know, bet big. So to try and help people, you know, change their services and to help you and as citizens or subjects to understand what's going on, we're putting every service, we're building a dashboard for every service and that'll show you you know, the uptake, digital uptake, um, the, the funnel, how many people visit the site and drop off, um, another, and, you know, availability and response time, all these things, we're putting them on the web, making that data available. And that kind of helps us do the transformation thing, which is to change these services, because people can compare, you know, themselves against other departments and, and other services. So to do that sort of task with those 700 services, we've, we've um, with collaboration with the departments, have come up with 25 uh, across 14 departments which we're working in a program about halfway through that and there are things like uh, lasting power attorney which is actually not in a bad state it's still a bit wonky and what you do is um, you know, I don't know about lasting power attorney but basically uh, I just did it for my mum my mum's getting elderly and she said well what happens if I have an accident or something can you you know can you uh, pay my uh, council tax so for a, you know I think it was a hundred quid or so um, I sort of filled in a form with her online wasn't very onerous, she totally understood it and then gave her instructions what she had to do. But it was still a printed form because it required a wet signature. Um, but it was it was usable. And you know, that's again like the uh, the care as allowance form we can use to sort of inform policy and sort of work out whether you really do need to print something out or whether you can do it all online. It's quite hard for us as a team, we've grown quite quickly, we've taken lots of people to actually engage and help these departments. Um, I'm travelling a lot. I mean, I'd love to stick around with you guys today, but I've actually got to go to two projects for two locations this afternoon. Um, we are finding it quite hard, uh, but it's very rewarding. Um, and, you know, one of the things that just amazed me is, um, you know, I've probably taken the pee out of them a bit, but it's not them, it's the circumstances they're in. The people I've met are uniformly all great and really care about you. And, you know, I can sort of say we do periodically, you know, hire. And if anybody here wants to sort of solve these kind of problems, please come and join us because it's a great gig. But one of the problems we do have is the organisations they work in are kind of basically they've the, if they haven't seen Agile, we're in, we're we're kind of going to do okay. If they've tried Agile and failed, we're in kind of difficulty because it's the cargo cult thing, you know. They they've kind of done all the theatre of Agile and not had the results. That's because they weren't being Agile. And you know, we just need to try and change the lot of people who are kind of charged of important services. And that's, that's hard. That's hard in very hierarchical organisations which have words like governance and uh, nugatory, which I never heard either of those words. Uh, does, does anybody know what nugatory is? 
Yeah, it means, sorry? It means, no, it means, it means um, so it's actually a word that's used a lot. It's, 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 um, it's kind of onerous and meaningless work. <laughs> and a, 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 lot, a lot of them, you know, and it's kind of used, oh, I've got some negatory work to do today. Oh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> so the way to fix it is to create these teams of mixed, mixed, you know, mixed capabilities, <coughs> mixed people, um, and they come together. And, you know, I heartly, heartfeltly believe this. And I'm kicking off a team um, this week. And, you know, the first thing I'd say was, when you introduce yourself, don't say which organisation you work from. Just say what you're going to do. And as a collective you know, we're going to make things work, and if it succeeds or fails, it's, it's amongst us all. But we do have people who are kind of in positions of responsibility, which is uh, a new thing. So we try and hire a senior person to be a service manager, a person who looks at those dashboards and actually worries about when things go wrong. That's one person, not a committee. And that kind of makes, you know, a massive difference. And to enable that, we've kind of done we've kind of created like, a, we've codified again, you know, a bit more meat than the design principles. Um, there's a thing called the service manual, uh, which if Amy's doing anything with web stuff or digital stuff, totally look at. Um, it's in two parts. The first part is advice, which is like, what do you do about cookies? What do you do about privacy? What do you do about um, deployment? Uh, the second part is actually a standard. Um, standard, I'm a standards guy, so I find the word, using the word standard for this is a bit hard because it's not, you know, it's not full of musts and shoulds. It's kind of just stuff that you have to, it's like a checklist of things you should do. But we do assess projects against this. And if they fail, they don't go to go from alpha to beta or from beta to live. We don't let them. And we've stopped some pretty big juggernauts using this, this tool. And the, um, and the criteria is basically start with the needs, as we said. Um, you'd be pleased to hear. Use open standards, uh, common platforms, make source code available. You know, you're using appropriate licenses, which is a moniker for open source. Um, the most important one is, uh, and the hardest one for them is, make sure you have technical capacity to make changes quickly and often. And the final one, which defeats some services, but <coughs> for good reasons, is show the minister using it, right? And We've, we've had events where we have ministers, um, uh, David Gork, you know, demonstrating the new tax platform. Um, you know, that's a revelation for a lot of departments. Where they say, oh, the minister needs this, the minister needs that. Okay, right, well, that's fine. You've built it. Right, can you just show, can you get him in a slot in his diary and get him to demonstrate it? Oh, well, he's not available. Well, then he's not that interested in it. So it's quite a, quite a good sort of conversation piece. Um, yeah, we're kind of we're trying to open up data. I've, I've talked about data a minute ago. Um, this is a tool which um, J.P. Rajaswamy, who I worked for in, in BT for a while, and was kind of a mentor. I, well, I treated him as mentor. And uh, he came up with this, and I think it's brilliant. Um, it's kind of slightly wrong, but it's, it's really useful. And he says, basically, if everybody's doing something, that's open source. You know, it's a common shared problem, share it. If only you're doing it, then nobody else is going to help you. So you've got to build it. But a bit in the middle, that's kind of the territory of buying things, that's the kind of uh, commodity stuff, you know. And that, for me, is a dangerous territory uh, because, you know, how often do you see a best of breed package, you know, for this pro problem and, you, come and you, come, you kind of find it's locked into some madness. I would kind of suggest that what's happening is that uh, that middle bit's been squeezed. Um, that's not to say that buying things is wrong, it just means we buy things differently. Uh, a good example of that we, is we buy services on GovUK, so which we use Zendesk for our ticketing system, which is a platform as a service you know, thing. It's great, but I'm pretty sure we can move to something else. And we used we use Akamai for a while, and then we changed CDNs. I can't remember who we're using now. But uh, we do, you know, we do sort of um, make sure we buy things in such a way we can change our mind. And that's, sort of, that's a better way of articulating the value of open source. Uh, and this is a page in the service manual which did start off by being called open source and actually ended up just being choosing technology. And the first thing it says is, it doesn't matter what you buy, what, it doesn't matter what you build, as long as you can change your mind. You've got to be able to move on and get rid of stuff and add stuff in there. We do a lot of stuff on GitHub. I know GitHub's not the coolest place in town, but um, it's, sort of, it's a place and it's good because we, when we bring developers in, by and large, they have accounts and they know how to use it and we can actually get things going very quickly. 
Um, there's currently a page on there about how we use uh, GitHub within GovUK. There's, you know, AlphaGov is our kind of, is our organization user. I believe it's like the second most active organization on GitHub. Uh, but there are other organizations, MOJ are pretty active and um, HMRC are just getting started, you might be surprised to find. Um, so that's quite interesting, I kind of think, you know, the you imagine how many comments this got. You know, we changed the picture of Larry the cat on the website, uh, whatever. And, uh, and then, but then some things are very useful. We got a pull request because we got the bank holidays for Scotland wrong. Now, it, that just boggles people. And so I think it's probably fair to say we're a little bit immature in terms of open source in, the, in that we are um, mostly coding in the open. We're working on things which are not quite to the product stage. You know, we're, we're working on things which you can find useful. Turns out that New Zealand government and the ODI are both using our, our uh, platform, uh, which is, you know, our CMS is basically a bunch of Ruby on Rails apps with Markdown for content. So in fact, all the editors for government content are writing Markdown, which I think a lot of people find weird. I'd prefer ASCII doc, but I'm too old. Um, so I think the next stage is when we start to, and we have made contributions. There are a couple of projects where we're putting love into it because, and love and money because um, it's useful to us and there isn't quite the right thing anywhere else. Uh, but where the maturity comes is when we start sort of um, actually, you know, stop creating projects and just start working on other people's projects. We're in that bottom tier of the, of the pyramid. So that's my talk, you know, make things open, it makes them better. Thank you. So I've, le I've left plenty of time for questions because I imagine, that, well, I'm hoping that you have some, and it's been the most interesting part for me. Uh, any questions, if they repeat them so that we've got them fully Okay, that's good, okay, it's fine. So go on, go on, you've had your hand up first. How far are you pushing this? Um, and one of the things I really liked was, was, was the idea of that the data has got to be open so that you can move to a different supplier or yeah. whatever you want to call it. How far are you pushing it down? Um, one example is schools. A lot of schools are locked into capita sin, bought by capita sins. Yeah. And people can't integrate with it simply because they don't tell you what the data stored and how it's stored. So I think um, you know, the model we've got is definitely, there's a, we're up to 400 and something people, and I think we're probably peak GDS. You know, we, we don't want to become the world's biggest you know, systems integrator, mm. right? We can't do that. That's not the model. The model is that we try and sort of help people and grow you know, capability where the problem's being solved. At the moment, we're not going into schools and we're not going to hospitals. Although, you know, as much as we'd love to, th those are big user needs, aren't they? You know, it, was uh, more, it was more the comment that any supplier to schools, right. or whatever, have got to make their data formats completely document so that right. competitors can compete. I don't know the extent of the open standard, even though I'm on the board, I'm not entirely sure about the extent of the diktat when they say use this standard. But for example, there is a, a challenge. So the way you, you can get government to look at a standard, say, uh, which is imposed into a contract, so you know, that would be the way to fix that, I think, is um, you go to the Open Standards Board and you make a challenge. So you say, okay, well, I think that there should be a, a way, a format or a way that schools should present data. My daughter, for example, um, failed her assessment, her assessment recently because uh, she used um, Open Office. Um, and the school couldn't you know, read the presentation that she produced. And that was quite upsetting. So I had to go into school and explain, you know, and I put it into a PDF and you know, we had a conversation. We had, we had the talk, you know, the talk about formats and things which they were looking at me and thinking I'm a nutcase. Turned out there were lots of us in the same situation who you know, had Macs or you know, non-Microsoft computers. Uh, it's a bit of a hot topic. Um, I mean, I probably, I should trade carefully, but because it's in um, going through the process, but there's, a challenge around um, documents and sharing documents. And the position it's in is that um, they split the challenge into two parts. One part is about publication. And, you know, certainly there may be other ways of publishing data, but it's not going to preclude putting things on the web. And then the second part is around um, documents which people want to share. Because that is really my use case, basically, uh, with my daughter. And that sort of... Um, I don't, I don't know how it's going to fall, but there's basically there's two options on the table, uh, as I understand it. You know, there's, there's open office, uh, sorry, there's ODS. 
ODF and OOXML. Um, and I think there are other formats. And basically, the, um, the conversation, as I understand it, is do you allow lots of uh, document formats and treat you know the fact that, that sophisticated software can read all these different you know formats, or do you do you home in on one and and then like that? And I think that will play out in the next few weeks. Week. Yes, match of weeks, and then there'll be a dic there'll be a dictator saying use this format or take this approach, uh, and that will be imposed on. I think it goes to schools and hospitals as well as uh, as government departments. So that might be one way of fixing it. Sorry? Yeah, sorry. I, sh I should. Uh, so I, I, I'm completely am adept here. I don't. I, I mean, the, the one thing I learn about government every day is how big and complex it is. You know. Yeah. So. From my experience, the one thing I've found out that when when they say you know this thing has got to be followed by local government, this thing's got to be followed by schools. Yeah. It's mostly ignored. Um, at the moment, yes, in central government you're able to do a lot, but we found as I spoke from my experience that the local government, yes, we have these things. We're supposed to look at open source right. policy and anything else, but it's just ignored, <coughs> and then we we ask forgiveness later. Right. You know, so there's this kind of so the second second strand is there's, there's what we can do by dictat, you know, jurisdiction, and then the second part is uh, leading by example. So not a week goes by, we don't have another foreign government or another organisation come through our doors and um, we explain what we're doing. And quite often they just validate what they're doing already, you know, using our words. And sometimes they, they get it and they go away and they, they change the way they're working. And, you know, sometimes they're doing it very differently. Like the Estonian government, it's a radically different model. It's really interesting. I don't know if you've looked at what... There's, there is a blog post um, on the GDS blog about the ex Estonian system. Basically, um, you know, they were in a predicament. In fact, it turned out they were kind of had a, advantages over us uh, because when they became a separate nation, um, they, the Russians left with all their, all, their I, all their IT and they had no money. So they had nothing. They had to start from scratch. And what they did was um, they built um, a system which is identity centric. So basically, you know, you, you've got like a, uh, your You've got certificates, you've got a certificate of signing, and you've got a certificate of encrypting, and then your phone or whatever, whichever device you've got. And um, whenever a service, you do anything, like you know, pay your tax or pay your car fines, whatever, you sign in with that certificate. And you could, the Noto ID brigade would, would you know, be very upset by this, but actually it turns out the way they mitigate that, the, the concerns of Noto ID, which are valid, you know, um, is that you can s you can tell who's using the data, so you can go to a log and see uh, these. And it's not the services, not like it's not like the department or the service. It's the person who's in charge of the IT system for that department. And it says this person accessed your data on this date, and they're pretty open and and um, upfront. Well, that speaks to an individual can see who's yeah. So you can go and you can go to any system, government system, in especially the identity system, and see who accessed your records. That sort of that non repudiation model isn't what we're building um, because we've got a very different problem that we don't want to have a single identity system for government. So we're kind of changing that. But um, yeah, it's just to say that other people are doing things differently. We can all learn from each other, but sometimes it's quite hard if you've got a very different mental model about how things should be. That was quite a long rambling answer to your question, but it's spawned what we're saying. Right. Is there a, there's, I remember a couple of years ago there was a, a big open government open source conference right. in London for which uh, vendors had to pay £3,000 for the privilege to attend. Oh, great. That's good. Which is great. And, but the, the point being that for <laughs> open source and for <laughs> SMEs and the like, yeah. this sort of approach is just nonsense. And it's, yeah. it's a complete contradiction. So is, is there a sense in your mind that you know, it's you totally changing? To size before anybody will okay, so it's totally changing. So um, all the projects we're working on, um, we kind of work. So we kind of, when we go to departments, we can either build it for them, which we wouldn't want to do, or we can build it, w or they can build it, or we can have this sort of halfway house where we kind of work together. Um, I don't think there's anything we're doing where we haven't brought in uh, an, a supplier who's got expertise in a particular area. And by and large, they're all small you know, enterprises. And the way we can bring them in quickly is through a platform called G Cloud. In fact, there's two kind of platforms, one called G Cloud, which is for commodity services, 
So you know, hosting and um, and software as a service and the like, and um, you know, some sort of um, standard expertise like CDNs and uh, are actually on G Cloud. And there's a thing called the Digital Service Framework, which if you're with SME, I would totally and you kind of offering consultancy skills, especially in open source. Totally recommend you um, you you look out the Digital Service Framework. There's a questionnaire which basically says, um, I will work through a service manual um, and I understand the principles behind a service manual and I've got some citations where I've done this before. If you do that, then it's very easy for to, in, to engage you, you know, and it's actually in many respects easier than the big boys because you know, um, they've got to change the way they work. <coughs> That's not to say that some big companies aren't you know, um, engaging with us and it's there are some amazing skills in those big companies but we're kind of unlocking and using them in a, a different way than before. Does that help? Go on. Um, you Sorry. Yeah. The PDF is not going anywhere near comfortable in schools. Yeah. Um, not yet. But yeah, so what, what are the plans in terms of, for example, the NHS to bring this to Well, they do have their own leadership and um, I don't really know much about the area but with the, the one of the... Um, I think one of the, the sort of digital or technical leaders is actually on the Open Standards Board, for example. Uh, Liam Maxwell, who's uh, CTO for government, is in GDS, and he has good relationships with those people. We have, um, you know, there are boards and panels around government. It sort of sounds a bit, you know, wonky, but actually they're very useful. And in GDS, we have a, an advisory board, which is people from industry who advise us on how we work. And there's also uh, people from within departments. Um, there's a digital leaders board, so e there's a digital leader from each sort of uh, each department. And then there's also um, uh, um, something which Liam has started, which is technical technology leader. And I think there are some people from NHS in that. So they're learning from everything else that's going on. We can't do it all, um, and I kind of it's a good result when we don't have to do anything, and then something gets better elsewhere. That's the open source way, isn't it? I mean, you know. You know. Sorry, I, uh, there's one. There's one back by the back here. Gone. Sorry, I'll get to you. Yeah. Right. We don't have much. Yeah. So sorry. So it was really basically we've got loads of money. Uh, you know, uh, and we haven't got, and the person who was, uh, person you were citing hasn't got any money, so um, that's that's a problem for them. Actually, the less money you've got, the easier it is, right? It's just it's counterintuitive, but it's just some kind of a planetary alignment. That I mean, it's not the people who are there at GDS; it's the the time. It's the right time for this, um, you know, because there was so much, you know. If you're risk averse, spending lots of money seems to reduce that risk when it doesn't actually, you know, it's building the right thing in the right way that reduces the risk. And the less money, when I, one of the least successful things I've worked on since being a GDS has been the one that had the most money. Uh, sorry, there was this guy here, sorry, I'm trying to keep, I'm trying to keep a cue, so there's you two here. Um, yeah. Well, there are many. I think there's. I think actually, Parliament is on record of saying there's an oligarchy of five suppliers. I don't think one of them was being with them, but there are lots of vendors uh, as well. But yeah. Right. I think that's a nature of government, and I don't think I can comment on that. But I think, you know, I'm kind of an optimistic person. I always think the right thing wins in the end. I do see it. I do see it, but I think it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be. Um, you know, uh, you wouldn't be right for me as a civil servant to comment on that. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Go on. There, there are two big um, IT-related projects in the public consciousness at the moment. One from. Right. Neither of which are, at least according to the press, terribly successful or terribly well received. How do you think you can learn from them? Well, I think I said in my talk, which is that some costs are, are really hard to deal with. 
And so if you've spent a lot of money on something, um, it has to, you know, it's quite hard. I'm not, I'm not talking about those two projects, I'm just talking about big projects in general. Like, let's, 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 let's just get this right. So if, you've, if you're in charge of a big project and you suspect uh, it's not going in the right direction, um, then, yeah, it's, it's really hard to do that without losing face or losing your job, right? And um, I don't really have an answer for that, apart from the Irish sort of directions thing, which is I wouldn't start from here. You know, uh, I met some guy from a very large supplier <coughs> who uh, quite proudly said, I'm in charge of big complex projects. And I, I just, I had no answer to that because that's like, you know, you're the problem, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Sorry, there's, there's, there's me here. Oh, there, go on. When you talk about FDI, yeah. and the way that you use the scope of code and that this uh, piece of technology provides barriers or some bad experience, have you had any passages in scope about how to get around that so the pace is natural to drop it? So, for example, right. I mean, go from system points and go, well, we don't know what else to improve and we should do a risk assessment right. rather than we should do a policy or a practice. So, um, Biggest agents of change I've found in any engagements I've got are security and fraud, right? Uh, and that's sort of, I think in the intuitive, they're, they're kind of blockers usually. But when you discover, you know, well, some of these things, you know, the risk, monetary risk, uh, some of these projects is massive. You know, for example, like a benefit system is eyed greedily by most sort of um, gang leaders as a big cash point. And, you know, you've got to sort of, you've got to make sure these things are sort of, you know, and, the, and the, the also they can run at no level of risk. You know, if you work in a bank, you know, you kind of have a risk rate of about 6%. Maybe you, if you're doing something like, you know, it's got a massive profit on it at 10%. But, you know, really, you know, we can't have any risk rate because when you're dealing with like a large percent of the, of the you know, the, the, the country's money, you know, and the, and the limits, and it's unlimited liability in so the case of some of the things we work on, then you just have to be really secure and really careful. Um, open source, um, I think there's uh, Ian Levy, who's the head of CSG, which is the government security you know, body, sort of, uh, you know, is, uh, he said, I won't quote him because he says things which I will be scared of saying, but basically, you know, it's, um, there's no reason not to use open source. There's lots of reasons to build systems which aren't secure, but you know those two are separate things. I mean, there is a problem with working in the open, and so kind of um, it is a it is an obstacle. You know that, that that standard say you should you know open source your stuff. Not saying you put everything in the open. Don't put your keys in the open. Don't put your deployment scripts in the open. You know, but put the bits like the web stuff, the web form. Put them in the open because somebody else might have a similar form and you can reuse it. So there's kind of two parts. One of them is consuming open source, which has risks. You know, if you just run Maven or, or Gem and you just take whatever you get and you don't think about that carefully and you don't react when the, a bug's discovered, then, yeah, more for you. Mm. So I think, I don't know how that helps you. I mean, the other thing to say is, is just use this as a citation. You know, we do it. And in fact, there's a colorthon. We periodically publish a colorthon about all the tools we use. And so Nginx and Varnish, all these other things are on there. I think saying the government's website uses varnish probably answers a lot of people's questions. <coughs> oh. I was looking at um, one government service a, a year or so ago that had what I regard as confidential personal data only to discover it was hosted in the USA. Right. So we don't do that. I mean, we. And that's what. I, that's. It's kind of tricky because I think cloud. Clouds are rubbish metaphor but the bit of cloud that is useful is distributed hosting so if you put all your stuff in a secure data center with the, the fastest pipe in the world that pipe can be really cut whereas if you host your stuff in distribu distributed fashion and you kind of use these kind of models like git and Git, you know bitcoin or these other models where things are spread out you can do better to do that successfully you know crumbs data may drift but, yeah but there's a difference between the source code yeah. and my personal information. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. Tax records or health information, stuff like that. It depends how it's stored. So it's a, bit, it's a deeper question than probably you've got the time for, but there's lots of ways of storing things in, you know, in a way that, that's not, you know, you can split it apart, you can, you know, 
sprinkle so PKR on it. And at the moment, yeah. we're looking at outsourcing um, a lot of its um, right. case work, which, which, which means that you know, criminal records and stuff are disappearing out to India. That doesn't give me a lot of confidence. No, that, that probably wouldn't give me a lot of confidence, but I don't know about a use case, so I, 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 it doesn't sound like the kind of thing we would normally advocate. Um, Necessarily, I, I, ca I can't comment on yeah. that. But um, any, I think I've got time for one more. I've got, I've got five minutes. Away. Oh, that's good. That's great. Any more? This way, it goes embarrassingly quiet because you only said five minutes. And <laughs> Oh, translation. So, um, so it turns out that most of the places where we've got translations for, we've got offices and got people there, and actually, so it's we've got a platform. It's a CMS, but like a CMS with a very small C. Um, it's just literally a text box where you type Markdown. Markdown in in right to left languages is quite interesting. Uh, it turns out it works. So, um, but you know, they, the people on the field edit stuff, and we we have a great sort of. Um, so we have a style guide, you know, about how people can write content, and we run workshops and training. We we kind of move ramping up to thousands of people across government who know how to write plain English now and follow a <laughs> style guide. It's good. Yeah. Can't, can't, can't. One last thing about agile is you change things. Yeah. One of the nasty things about agile is that you change things. Yeah. In particular, um, I've got some wikis which point to some government websites, and the links keep uh, right. on breaking. Well, so I think I talked about that before. We do, I mean, I, my kind of, I was brought in to try and work out how to launch GovUK. And my answer was, don't break the web. And I kind of, something I do believe in, it does happen. Um, we're not always brilliant about link checking. I have to confess that. But it's something that a lot of us care about a lot. Um, you know, sometimes it's quite hard because I, on Direct Gov, there were lots of pages where it did like four things on one page. And then, so if you've put somebody's bookmarked that, you don't know why they've bookmarked it, so you don't know where to take them necessarily. Yeah. It's it's not always easy. Yeah, but I mean, can you sort of maintain the old page with a big red "This is deprecated"? Oh, yeah. so so we do we do that effectively. So um, when we switched our gov off, you know, the page I showed about the pulling on a pullover. If you go to that link now, it says 410. It's a HTTP 410 uh, code which is gone, and there's a link on the page to the National Archive. Um, we did try redirecting people straight to National Archives, but people, well, because of cookie law, they just zone out any kind of warning message now on a web page. And so they didn't realise it wasn't still alive. And we, you know, so we do sort of say, whoa, you know, this page is gone. It's over there if you want to have a look. Can you tell us a little more about the university projects or something you said that we can? Is it very likely on the current? So we have had some involvement, that's public. It's one of our, you know, um, it's one of our exemplar programs and we did sort of show them some prototyping work and you know, we worked with them with a team from DWP and GDS people and built some stuff which has informed the work they're doing now that's probably about all I can say about it now it's quite a sensitive thing I mean you know but that's that's that's, that's me just regurgitating what's in public already That is a plan. It's all standardised through through OIX. Uh, so sorry. So is the is the identity platform available to non-government parties? I guess. I think potentially yes. Um, that's probably why we've got commercial uh, interest. Um, you know, we're creating a marketplace basically, and you know, initially it'll work for signing to government services, but um, the, it's based on standards. The OIX is where a lot of that stuff's been standardised. And we've got lots of kind of good practice guides, and I, I don't think it's it's sort of you know out of the realms of possibilities that it would be a commercial thing. Yeah. Thank you very much.